And so I'm the pleasure to welcome uh, with help uh, oh, Julie Cal uh, Thomas Demanda, uh, a famous artist that uh, I maybe I don't need to to present uh, in detail. We will discuss with him about uh, his uh, career, uh, production, intellectual uh, uh, accomplishment. Uh, I ask a lot to the public to, to question him. Uh, we would love it to have more uh, an open debate uh, with a lot of questions, participation from the public. Uh, so we just start, let's say, uh, proposing some uh, tracks. Uh, to abort that, we have a lot of images anyway uh, to stimulate that. So thank you for coming uh, on such a long journey in uh, one day. And let's start. Huh? OK. Thank you, for, thank, you. thank you for inviting me. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very ha happy to be here, and I thought like the seminar today was very, uh, and yesterday, but I missed that part. It was amazing, and I keep. I have to say, I keep running around telling people um, that the notion of the model as a cultural practice is actually something which is completely under uh, exposed. Um, everybody talked about for a long time about the iconic turn. Um, I think the, the model is the real key, and the model has not been very well uh, uh, researched in terms of theory. We still kind of swap all the time between what the model represents, what the model is, and the categories of what the model um, is made of, because that's completely three different things. And if you look at the painting, that's very clear to you, but if you look at the model, everything is becoming a big model, because nobody had a category or a theoretical toolbox for that, really, it seems like. Or too few people, let's put it that way. So I'm very happy to be here. It's a pleasure, and uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, just a, a very easy question to start. And uh, I, I, we ask you to, to um, send an image uh, to, to present uh, your uh, Your presence here and your presence of a of a colloque, and uh, and you send this uh, backyard uh, from 2014, and I want simply to ask you why you send this and uh, what was your reason of a connection with us? Um, I that's the first question is the most difficult one. <laughs> so I um, no, it's a stage. It's like this one is just like a stage, and it kind of. It looks to me, when I saw it first, I thought, okay, here we have a picture which we know very well, or like it means a lot at the time when it came out, but also at the same time it, it has some hidden qualities which are probably not visible at first sight, or like I, th I think I could probably kind of uh, emphasize on those with how I work. <clears throat> and the main thing for that was um, the, uh, was the blossoming tree in the back because the blossoming tree, we, all the connotations we have with blossoming trees is youth, love, spring, power, the future, uh, emo emotional affection, you know, like all these kind of, this, the whole palette of uh, notions which we kind of uh, come up with when we see a tree like that. And at the same time, you have the foreground, which is a little bit run down. And it has a lot of uh, um, resemblances of to, to the classic you know, the, the, the pilgrimage to the United States, the old house from the East Coast, which like Ansel Adams is an Ansel Adams photograph. You have also, why I like, why I bring this one up, is like you have the fence, and the fence is kind of basically sheltering you from the wilderness. So the fence, when the fence came in into the cultural uh, vocabulary, and also in reality, in fact, in America, that, mean, that meant that, you know, this is the community, and everything behind the fence is the wilderness is it's basically aggressive and here this whole thing is completely uh, in, in, inverted because the picture is based on a photograph which I saw first on the New York Times but it was everywhere it's kind of a photograph of a, um, sure? yeah sure <clears throat> um, it's like the uh, 
the wife of the Boston bomber um, um, uh, is leaving the house. And when the photographer of the New York Times, is, which is a very good photographer, when he, when he photographs the house as an assignment, like just to where, where are these people are actually living on the next day, um, this person was on the photograph as well. And there's a famous like, quote by, I think it's... Uh, um, Ugh, I can't remember which one, but like it's it's uh, Friedlander, Lee Friedlander. He said like you know like if you photograph a house uh, or like your your uh, no if you photograph your daughter, then you have a house in it and you have a, pl a sky with it and you have a line in it and maybe there's a bird on it and you get it all for free. And in the same way here you have like you know he's f about to photograph the house, but he gets so much more on the photograph. And I thought this whole, the whole, you know, the, the wilderness, the fence, the blossoming, the qualities of all that, and then the, the foreground, which is about the Boston bomber and the person who comes out of the community, and she's, a, she's an American person who kind of got con uh, converted to uh, Islam. So it's all very, very complex and it's all connected. It's not really that you can say, okay, these are the bad ones and these are the good ones or something like that. So that whole story became, um, I thought it was very powerful, and that's why I thought it would be interesting to first work with it and then actually show it here as well. I, on, in succession to that first photograph, of course, you can today you can see everything online. So you know, like other photographs came out the same day because like there must have been like 60 photographers in front of that building. The photographer himself, he didn't know who is leaving the house. That came out only later. So you know, she's some, somebody left the house, and he, he couldn't wait for the shot. Um, and then you have Google Street and all the, you know, like it's, it's, it's well explored and I didn't have to go there. So usually what I do when I make a photograph like this is I look very carefully at the material which I have at hand and I reconstruct it completely from the representation of that event and not the event. So. Okay. Could you tell us, Thomas, very concretely, how do you select the images and... <coughs> How do you maybe collect them? Do you have a lot of images? Uh, where do you found them? Uh, something very, very simple, but... Uh. Yeah, I do. I, I have to, I, I mean, there's so many things I came up today in this, in this conference as well, which I think is important. One of them is like the, for the internet, the digital availability of everything is, is not the most inspiring environment. You know, you used to find something and you thought, oh wow, this is amazing. And then you just go run, run away with it. And today you just go online and you find everything you could even think of. And because you find so much, it's just actually, there's even not the point anymore to do it in a, in a weird way. So I thought like it would be, um, so I started with a picture archive where I just, you know, f I kept basically everything you know, I found interesting. But then the picture archive at, at some point beca became digital because it's kind of, you know, easier. And then also I'm traveling all the time, so it's easier to get a hold of. And I have to say that the, that the original picture ar archive was always a little bit more forthcoming. But so I have, it's, it's a couple of things at the same time. I have ideas, which are what, what I want to do. And they, they can be very structural, like, you know, the same thing again and again, for instance, or um, a picture from above, or, you know, like very simple, you know, things which I think I haven't done and I think I would like to explore. That also has to do with the typology of the image because like, you know, like most of the pictures we look at today are actually private images on social media rather than so-called so official images in a news circle. And the private images in the news circle are even more authentic than the official ones. So there's a huge shift going on in what we look at, what we see when we look at a photograph. And so I have this structural idea, and then at some point I, I see something, and I realize that was exactly what I was looking for, even without knowing. And that's basically because I, I knew already what I was looking for, but I didn't know what it looks like. So you sort of have an image in your mind, and you find it... Yeah, as soon as, and I'm, at some point I was, I was like really afraid that I would run out of images. I would run out of pictures, because every artist thinks that. And then there came these pictures like, you know, from all kinds of sources, which I never thought would, that's the good thing about the digital prol the proliferation of the images, that we know so much more than before. But like, you know, like the world is so complex and so, uh, it's, we constantly struggle to predict what's gonna happen, and we're very bad in predicting, really. So, you know, like there will be a surprise tomorrow morning, hopefully. And 
When you find an image, then you work on it on the computer before? No, no, no. no. I make a, if I'm not, because this takes two, two, three months to make this. I'm all these models. Can you go? Maybe go back. So, Roberto, just one, one back. Uh, back? Yeah. yeah. Two or three months? Um, yeah. I mean, this took me half a year because the tree was so complex. But the, um, so you just you know like I'm, it's actually if I'm not sure it's worth it, then I make, might make a drawing. But then, actually, it's much easier to kind of just go ahead and just build it. I don't, I hardly ever use a computer for that. Uh, maybe you can continue to tell you how you produce this, these images? In, well, in detail. I know that you have many images about that. Um, so I... Um, I put it this small to, to not compete with hmm? your original images. That's oh, no, no, this small. one is not the original image. This is Toy Story. Oh. But, and I had a couple of more which didn't lo load up. But like this, there, is a, there is a topos in this picture as well. There is the picture as a news story. There is the picture with the, with the blossoming tree, which is a total extra. And it's actually not very useful for the message of the picture, why it is in a newspaper, because it's bringing up the wrong connotations. Uh, but there's also Topos, which is like the, you know, the American iconic, uh, um, the wooden house which we built ourselves or something like that. <coughs> and so, no, and then I make this thing in, in three dimensions. And I, you know, they, this one is very la very tall, uh, which was a little difficult because I had, my studio is not that tall. But when, you know, then... Eventually we done, <laughs> but this one was like the the, the tree. We, I built first the tree because I didn't know whether the tree would look believable or not. So I, we spent literally half a year only making the tree. But I never had, and I, I do that with people, with friends and, and, and assistants, because I just you know this is like a tree has so many leaves, you you would not succeed. But I never had a ha happier team than working on a on a pink tree. It's it's it is actually really contagious. So. So it's all cardboard. Yeah, it's all cardboard, even the backside. And could you elaborate a little bit about this? Why, why only cardboard? Well, it started, um, um, you know, like if you if you would never ask a painter why only acrylic paint. You know, it's not that different. But the. Uh, um, so I started with making sculptures very early on, and these sculptures, I didn't know, I never, you know, I studied sculpture, but I never made one up to then, and I thought like, okay, they, I'm sure they suck, and I don't want to spend my money on my time on something which I, I dump anyways. And so I started with like very ephemeral objects, things which I could actually discard easily, and I wouldn't spend like weeks and weeks in a workshop. And so I made these kind of objects, and at some point, I had so many of them that I had a problem with storage. Very simple, because every, every sculptor has a problem with storage. And so um, I, I had to kind of choose which one I think are really good and which are not so good. And I chose very radically, like tw about 20, and uh, which I could keep. And then if I had a new one, which I thought was as good as the other 20 ones, I would take one out of the 20. And so I did that for a year, which was very, uh, a very exhausting process. And then at some point my professor said, I think you should photograph them before they throw them away. And I, I thought, okay, then I do that. And then the photograph of that looked so bad. Um, according, you know, the, the object I thought was really beautiful and I loved it by then because it was one of the 20, you know. And so, and the photograph was so lousy that I had another problem at hand and that's how it, the whole thing started. And then paper is a very good material because everybody knows paper. Everybody had paper in his hand today, once at least or twice. And um, so everybody has a subconscious idea how the material works. Like you, you just kind of crump, crump, crumple a piece of paper together, you throw it in the bin. That is, you know, an interaction with the material. It's, um, it has a surface which is really, like the empty sheet of paper is very beautiful. It has, a, it has the connotation of being very temporary because except of books, we only use more, you know, the paper cup for the coffee, the napkin, we, we use paper for very kind of, you know, one or two day maximum duration, and then we throw it away, it gets recycled and becomes another thing. And so I thought all these kind of things are actually for that, what I wanted to do was very good, but it wasn't, it was a gradual, um, a build up. It wasn't like a, one morning I woke up and say, I only do paper projects now. And then, you know, like now I stick to it, I not not slavery in a slavery sense, but I, I, um, 
I think the, the aspect of like everybody knows paper in, as a physical uh, surface is actually very welcoming because in a way you come to a picture and you have the feeling somehow I know it already. And that's a really good thing, I think. You know, like, so it kind of it welcomes you a little bit more than if it would be a computer rendering, for instance. It's a, a big curiosity about the destruction of the models. What, what, yeah, what, what you do? You, mm. I think I can help you with that one. So this is a, this is a detail of the thing, which I only show because of the shindles. This is the same picture, only bigger. And you can see on the screen. So, for instance, this is a picture which is uh, the outside of one of the one a room which I show, which is coming up a little later if you need it. It's a uh, you know you see it's there's no it's a piece of it's big very large pieces of cardboard but it's just cardboard. And then um, I can also change it really easily myself. I don't need anyone to to if and and I'd rather do that than doing it on Photoshop or like in post production because post production gives you all the all the, the the widest range of things to, you can change, and in the end, you just get very insecure of what do I want to change because I could change anything, and so, <clears throat> I mean, by nature, it's every picture or every work an artist does is probably not a good artwork until you kind of know it's a good artwork and you let it go, and this insecurity is not very it's it's, it's not come, it's not meeting uh, the other insecurity in a very very productive sense, which is the Photoshop. Oh, is it ready? Or could I do it better? Or maybe I bring, you know, whatever, because you can do so much. And it used to be with analog photograph photography, one of the good things is that you just, once you have your photograph, you know, you can do a little bit in, in printing, but not actually that much. But then you had to let it go. And it's, I think that's a really healthy process. And now you just can think around so long on it and then just come back and redo it and stuff. It's not a way, it's, I think at some point things have to be let go and go. This I, but that's how I built them, sorry. I, I'm, I'm, I'm very, I don't know, sometimes I'm tempted at some detail to have some of your cardboard detail, like a nice piece of, to keep it on the table at home and this kind of, uh, of object. Uh, but it seems you, for you it's very far. At the same time, for me, it's uh, what you say, it's, it tells me a lot about your uh, the identification of you as an artist. And you're mostly considered a photograph. That's just quite amazing. At the point that uh, usually people think that you study in Dusseldorf as a photograph, but you study in Dusseldorf as a sculpture, not in the famous program, uh, Andre. And um, we also study archi interior architecture. I discovered that. Well, that was very early on, but it, it was it was very funny because, like in Munich Academy, you get sent to a class. They assign you. They look at your portfolio if they accept you, and then they say, you go there, and you go there. And they sent me to there, which was interior. It wasn't design in the sense of design. It was more interior gestaltung. Um, but it was, for, uh, it was a really funny class. It was the one odd class, which nobody knew what to do with. It was for sacred rooms. And that was a consequence of the Second Vatican Council, where they had to kind of re arrange all the churches, and Bavaria has a lot of churches, and so they had to rearrange everything, like where, how, where, how, how the, where the altar is, that the priest is not standing with the back to the community, he's standing with the front, so you had to change all these things, and nobody knew, and, but they all, all these churches have like a, a lot of artifice in there, so somebody really professional and good has to do it, and so somebody had to teach that, and that was my professor, and it was really the weirdest environment I found myself. But I left. It made me also really. It was. It made it much easier to leave that as well. But I started in sacred, especially, and it, it's really called interior Gestaltung, especially for sacred rooms. So, and anyway, you didn't want to do something for the photo. No, I went to Düsseldorf because I knew that I cannot. I knew, I also, I think it's, it's very good to kind of uh, go to other places every now and then, just to reinvent yourself and like to re to reestablish the parameters of your practice and actually yourself. And so, I I uh, I knew this in Munich. There are cities like you know. There are cities, and people will hate me for that. Some people in this room even will hate me for that. But there are cities which are very bad for artists, and they're very good for art. 
but because you know like Paris is one used to be one Paris is getting much better but it used to be really suffocating because everything is there you have all the one most wonderful art in the museums already everybody looks pretty everybody knows what to do with aesthetics everything it's so complete that you just really there's no point of entry for you as a young artist Berlin was the opposite Berlin was a very bad city for art to look at art because you know the uh, the museums weren't really great and I'm still not sure they are so great but uh, but it gave you a lot of entry points as an artist to do, you know, a dilapidated building there, a group of people there, which you, you know, and stuff. And so for me, Düsseldorf, going to Düsseldorf, was, uh, leaving Munich was more or less like realizing that Munich is very good for looking at art and it's very good for always having a job when you need one, but it's not very good to, for being an artist. And so it kind of basically, you know, I, I had to leave, that was very... And then I went to a sculptor in Düsseldorf um, and I was painting at that time, but I knew that I didn't, I didn't, I won't be a painter. <clears throat> and then, um, and I never kind of, I said once, I told this story before, so forgive me for if I repeat it, but like the, I went once because of the photography thing, because I was so unhappy with my own photography. And I didn't know what I'm doing wrong, because I never have done a photograph before. Maybe that was part of it, but the... I didn't know where, where, how to fix it. And then my professor, who didn't know either, he sent me up to the Bechers. And so I made an appointment with Becher on a Tuesday. And, uh, and then he, I went there and said, look, look at this. This is the sculpture. It looks great. And this is the photograph. And this sucks really. Can, you know, what, what do I do? And he said, <laughs> well, I think you need to do an apprenticeship, you know, which means like three years schlepping the cables and the, and the suitcase of a photographer and just following him and helping him. And for me, the whole idea of like making a paper sculpture was like, I can do this and then I throw it away and make another one and I'm, I'm really speeding up and I can, you know, I'm very flexible. And so the apprenticeship was the complete opposite of what I wanted. So, and then I just, and years later, actually like the, uh, like the two days before Hilla Becher died, I happened to meet Hilla Becher and she told me um, that Bernd Becher, that he remembers that he followed the work very closely afterwards, which I totally unbeknownst to me. But he said this at the time, and she, he told her at home, he said this at the time because he didn't know either. <laughs> because, and she said, because I did all the photographs with Bechers, you know? So it's just, you know, you just, that's the environment you find yourself in and you try to. Adjust so how, how you get better on taking pictures? Hmm? How you get better to get in pictures? Uh, learning by making mistakes. So. At that time, there was no digital, I say it for... Hmm? Uh, at that time, there was no digital, no, I no. say for... Uh, no, but I mean, you know, for me, still the photograph is the main thing. And I'm still, I'm very hopeless to kind of talk with photographers about photography because I don't have much to contribute to that discussion. But, but your imaginary also switched to photography. I, I love you started with uh, uh, Evan's picture because he put you in immediately in an emerging another context. Mm, mm. Well... I think, um, I think the sculpture, the, the you know, like the for me, the sculpture is like make is it's like, like thinking with hands. That's what why I'm making models. That's why what I do. But I don't want to have belittling models. I don't want to mo have a model where you look down into and you think like, ah, the world is not such a bad place because it's so cute. You know, I think the world is not cute. By it's very seldomly cute. Um, and I think, like, I, as an artwork, should be, it should, f before anything else, it should be intelligent. And it should be not, m not less intelligent than you possibly can be. You know, like, I mean, I th it can be nice or something, but it doesn't have to be nice. It can be, or it should, be, the one thing it should really be is intelligent. And I think that is, um, I don't know why I'm saying this now, but like, I think that's really important. And the model, kind of, the whole model, notion of the model kind of tends to, uh, get in the way, you know, because it's, in the end you see, oh, it's only a model or something like that. And I'm trying to, uh, that's one thing I'm trying to avoid and kind of keep really in the forefront is like that the, that the reality I show you or like, is, which is not a reality, that it's about that transfer of like representation, what is a picture. And that's what I'm trying to kind of achieve with the photography. But other than that is, um, I still, you know, I still feel like a sculptor. That's why, what I'm teaching in Hamburg as well. <laughs> Uh, so I have read a lot of uh, your interview and I found one that was particularly interesting because you were explaining such an opera, some, uh, 
another dimension for me that was you you were talking about you were in England uh, I think a courtyard I don't know where but and uh, in I don't know you were remember this picture this is from the attentat to Hitler and, and you were in the or you were identify yourself or presented with this picture that show of a good German, no? And, uh, and one of your... It, it shows that there was a good Germany. It yeah, doesn't show the good German, unfortunately. And, uh, and then, uh, I don't know, eventually, when, how, how near you did this, uh, that was... Um, well, I think, you know, photography is very much about memory as well. And memories are, I, mean, and I don't mean this in a one-dimensional sense, but memory, we don't have memories. We don't have pictures in our head. We don't have memories in our head. We construct them. Every time we think of something, we construct the picture for ourselves. So it's kind of a process. It's not like a still point, you know, like other, other than the monument which is standing outside. But how we memorize things is actually a processual. Like it's, a, it's a verb and not a substantive. And so... When I came to, I came from Düsseldorf, I left to Paris, and then that's why I know what I'm talking about, and then I left to London from there. And so I studied at Goldsmiths, did my MA there, and then I just realized when I came to London that what I was practicing in Düsseldorf was just a dialect of art. But in Düsseldorf, you think like, oh, we are the most important person in the you know, place in the world, so that's how art is made. And you just come to London, and people would just wouldn't actually not buy what you're saying. They would just not understand what you're saying, and if, they wouldn't agree. So I just had to kind of reassess a couple of, my, of the things that I was really sure about, one of them being color, for instance, nice color, bright color or something. But then also, I just kind of suddenly found myself in, in, a, in an environment which was not necessarily very admir admir admiring German culture. You know, they were, they were respecting it, and they were probably acknowledging it, but it wasn't like, you know, yeah, and every corner at that time, I'm not sure it's, still, it's changed much, but in every corner you would find like a, you know, like something about Germany and the crowds and like this and that. Coming to that is also that my English wasn't very good, so I had a strong accent. And then that the goldsmith and all the art practice there is very much about talk, talking. And it's not so much about working, it's more, way more about presenting your case. <clears throat> so I had to kind of present myself all the time in an environment which I've made me really aware of like who I am and where I come from, which was not the case in Düsseldorf at all. And so I thought, okay, what is the, my identity and what is the picture, what is the, play, the, the role of a picture in my own construction of my identity? And I thought, um, as somebody who grew up after the war in an environment, in a school system, which kind of tried to educate people never to kind of do the same, uh, horrific, you know, like crimes again, but also like n never have a failing society again. We were taught and every year again and again in, 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 uh, in school about like what happened, what was there and what wasn't there. And one thing which wasn't there much was resistance. And so this is one of the few pictures which you would look at all the time, which would kind of basically prove that there, that there is another way. You could say no. You probably would die with this, but you, there, there was there were people which were, were saying no, and somehow, like if you make pictures, you think like how much did that picture actually in, influence me? Uh, if 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 I'm a product of that in uh, uh, upbringing, um, what is the pic the role of that picture in my memory, and also what is it with other people? And I had an invitation, my first one of my first shows in a in a group show in a museum, which was of all places was in Munich, the Haus der Kunst which is a Nazi building, which was built for like to show the good German art. And I showed that picture in there. I made the picture basically for that show. And I thought like, oh, now they're going to lynch me. Because like, how can you, you know, how can you use the, the images of like these kind of heavily connotated and s sacred images? How can you use them to make a paper sculpture of that? And nobody recognized the image to my big surprise. No, not a single person recognized what it was. So. That's how this came together. So uh, you were talking about references and um, perception of um, images and photographs. I was uh, wondering if you could tell us a little bit about, um, uh, of course, we all think of uh, the Merzbau of Kurt Schwitters. And it's, we, we know this fantastic uh, 
project by the photographs that we, we have left. So we, it's difficult for us to imagine the whole house with the nine or more rooms, uh, uh, you know, with all this, uh, these leftovers and scraps uh, uh, and wood uh, fragments um, there. So maybe, um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, of course, in Germany, it might have been a, a key point in the in, in your, I don't know, references. Not so much, surprisingly. I it, I. I I grew up in a household with with my both parents were like teachers, but they studied at the academy. So the, I I would say that I knew my stuff really well when I, you know. But I, the maths power I discovered actually way later. But the, you know, Schwitter's dad was a whole his whole attitude was like this. So he would kind of run around. He would always come with a bicycle, and he would kind of in his pockets he would have little snippets of words he cut out. So if you see one of those collages, that's probably he found this in his pocket, and he just thought like, oh, that's good. And he put it there. So, you know, like, and then everybody knew that he has all these kind of things. He also was an art teacher, by the way. He kind of supported himself with that. And then he became a graphic designer. But at, at the same time, because, like, the, there was a connection and there was a possibility to do Pelikan or Geha, one of the two, or maybe or even both. Um, but the Merzbau, as far as I know, was like, it was like cancer on the, on, on the house. It was really like, you know, like every floor, and his son kept saying this. It was a nightmare. And every you would hurt yourself in every corner, and it was just, you know, it's constantly somebody's hammering, and every on Christmas he would hammer, and still kind of to put something there and something there, and then rip the bottom part of it out again and stuff. So it's a, it's his way of like, it, it was more than an artwork. I feel you know, like now I think it's right, and then we can leave it or something. It was a process again. So. But then when you see there's a reconstruction in Hanover, which is very good to see because you can get a sense of what it meant for him to do, but it's actually disappointing because the, the po photographs are so much more power powerful than that because they're so outworldish. Because you on the photograph, you also see the time when it's made. And when you stand in the environment, you d it's now. And somehow the, you know, the, the outrageous eccentric eccentricity of that Merzbau is much more powerful if you see it in the context of the, of the time. Would you say that um, it's the same for you that the, the, the photographs are more oh, powerful yeah. than the models? Well, you haven't seen a model, you know, so, but. <laughs> <laughs> but you have seen them. Yeah, I, yeah, no, but it's, um, I w there is one model existing, so you can do the test yourself. It's in, in Milano in the basement, in the Fondazione Prada, they have on. But the, the grotto? The grotto, yeah. <clears throat> but the, um, no, I think the, the models are actually better than the photographs, but there's no way to keep them. There's no way to, but that's also for me because I work so long on them and then somehow the photograph kind of folds it back into two dimensions. You know, it's, it's very often I make things which I never w would be able, I would have never been able to enter this room ever, you know, and somehow through making it myself, I can. And that's kind of something which is actually really kind of interesting as a bodily experience. And I think that's, con that's more or less gone in a, in a photograph. So, you know, I'm torn, obviously. I don't know. <laughs> so if you could, you, you would have kept everything? No, 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 no. I just need to get, I need to have a clean, a clean sheet of paper. I they also get on my nerves at some point, you know, you just really need to move on. And so also, paper is not lasting very long. So half of the time I spend when I'm nearly done with something, half of the time I'm spending to kind of uh, repair the damages which have been happening in the last month already. And so it's a, it's a, it's a little bit of a, a nightmare to work with paper in a bigger scale. But I, um, you know, it's, it's fine. It's just more, they really not last, uh, they don't last long, really. Um, are they very expensive to produce? Very cheap. Now it's getting more expensive because nobody makes paper anymore. And I mean, you know, like one of the things of paper which I also liked is like if you go to a store, like a, like a you know, like a Schreibwarenladen, uh, what's that? Like a, a, a store store for pens and all this. Um, you used to be able to buy paper, and uh, the, the the palette of this paper, like the colors range, would be the most popular color range. So now, if you come from painting in art school, one of the big issues is always your palette. You know, oh, how he's kind of the muted white colors in Lüchtheimans are really beautiful, aren't they? And so, and with me, I just have the palette of 
the, the corner store. And if something doesn't sell, it's not going to be in the palette next year, which I find really a big relief. You know, it's just like your picture died. No, it's just connected to this because you at a certain point uh, you you started to do movie too. Yeah, that uh -huh. was what had to do with the fact that I realized that on one hand the discussion about the work was more and more into like is photography lying, which is a really not a very interesting discussion, but it was very important at some point. But it doesn't lead to anything. Of course, the photography is lying. It was always lying, and then. But at the same time, people would only kind of contextualize the work, and then at some point it gets back to you too. You'd start thinking, oh, yeah, maybe photography is lying or something. You know? so, and I just thought, like, if, when I can move through a space, I didn't want to show the real thing because it's the real thing is actually trivial and it doesn't last and it's just, you know. But I thought, like, the, the, the experience of moving through a space, an artificial space, is actually very interesting. And I thought the film, if I have... If I make a film, it's always something I can't do with a still photograph. But there are buildings, like a tunnel, for instance, which are made for film. Or like, you know, the movement of... Uh, there's a film by me con called Pacific Sun, where, like, it's a, it's, a, it's a camera on a ship, and you have all these kind of 800 objects, be stop motion, kind of going from left to right, and then it gets more and more chaos. That I couldn't do on a photograph. It would just not work. And so that's when film came into play. Lots of animations, but also, you know, not on a real. You want to continue to do that, or was just? Um, yeah, but they're so expensive. Yeah, they seem to, to make. The way the process, <laughs> you I have to one pass one one. No, it's, uh, <laughs> no, but it's also like it takes so long. So, I did one last last December, maybe in, a, in half a year. I start another one, but they really take a long time, and nobody needs an animation. So you know, like just, I I only really do it if I'm convinced it's the right thing. So. So maybe we have another uh, chapter about your political work. And uh, yeah, to make a transition, I was thinking, listening to you, that maybe uh, the time you, you, you need to, to build all the, the project uh, is a kind of a... Um, uh, a, a sl it's it's very slow. It takes it needs a lot of time, and the, the the photograph is quite quick. So, would you say that to 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 rebuild the the picture with the cardboard is a a kind of a resistance already to the production of images? And um, Yes and no, because I think, you know, like the, the ocean of the images and the, the waves of the images and all this, all these, these are not very useful terms, I think, because, you know, like we are actually coping very well with it. It's quite amazing how much we can process in terms of images. And if, if I, when I started to be, you know, thinking about being an artist, you would have, um, there were seminal books about photography, but also about theory, which you had to have read. Otherwise, you cannot even talk, you know uh, you know sit at a table. And so, I think the textual quality has been really going into the background, like comment, you know, like the text, and and with it also like the understanding that a text is not is another way of representing an experience, but it's not the experience. You know, they, these are all signs, symbols, uh, symbol, uh, systems of symbols. And pictures are one, and text is another one. But the text was so dominant in the 70s, 80s. Um, that you just kind of then the pictures now are really uh, we we everybody is that like oh there's too many pictures we cannot process them but we can we do on a daily basis and it's really quite surprising how well we do how well we uh, learned also to understand that two things one is like that it's always important to know where the picture comes from who it's way more important than before that to kind of know the source of the image and what and the reason why it got to me. And the other thing is like that I think that the, um, I read a, in, in somewhere in a Texas newspaper for some reason, I read a, a little survey that like uh, the Texans below 30 or 29, 45% of the male Texans uh, say that they would rather communicate with pictures than with words. And now you can cut off the mail in the Texas, but it's kind of amazing that people would actually really say that I'd rather communicate with pictures because the picture communication is, on one hand, super complex. On the other hand, it's, you can say so little with it. You know, you can, you know, do you like a steak? And then you have an emoji, or what is the, you know, like the emoji, the, the, 
communicational idea of pictures is very limited, way less than language. But people seem to be really thinking that pictures are... That means that they use them way more than they ever did before. And that's... So I think the, the flood of pictures is not... Is, is just kind of uh, diffusing what we really have to uh, understand and, and what we actually learn, I really think. But of course my work is so slow, you know. I mean, making this work is kind of... I cannot contribute much to this discussion, maybe five images a year, but um, that's my own problem, so. So what, what's about? The, the I glue? just wanted to counterpart this one because... <laughs> 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 That's perfect. That's more to be. No, I, I, I want to start there. We want to start. Yeah, this is this is model. So I kind of help you. In. This um, is so to go towards architecture. That's more yeah. Like. This is no. This is model because like you know like again like in a big, big notion that you. That's why I'm probably here. That in my work is like the idea of the model, and so we have like couple, we have like two the main two uses of models. The no the idea of the model, the term of model is like a architectural model, and the children's model. They're both very important, but they by far not all the models we use. But like, so the children's model is important because, like, actually the extrater extraterrestrial uh, uh, thing we saw today. What's really interesting is like the, that the simulation of an experience predecesses the experience itself. If you go to space, you need to know what's an emergency, and you have to have uh, basically exercise it beforehand. Otherwise, you cannot recognize, is this a emergency or is it just malfunction or is it, you know, so that's why they do keep doing the simulations of that. And as a kid, you just have like, you know, like you have a little dog out of plastic and there's probably more, th more of a dog you see before you see a real one. So it's kind of, you know, you learn with little renderings, caricatures of the real world, you, you just understand how things work and what a car is and what a puppet is and what a whatever is, you know, so... Okay, we have these two, and then you have the puppet house, and that's about cuteness, and it's about my role in a social structure, and blah, blah. So, but that, that's not really a very far-leading uh, notion of a model, I think. And then you have the architectural model, and what we saw with today very well with the film clip. Uh, the architectural model is always looking like, is incredibly misleading, because you, you bend down on your knee, and you look from underneath, but the eye, your eye is already as big as a double-decker bus driving by the building. So it's you like a cyclop looking at something. But the main experience you have to that is not, you're not going to be, going to be rolled in on a, on a bed alongside the thing. You come in and the model is standing there. So you are God, you're looking down to the model, and that's how we feel physically. And you can prove it very simple. It's just like, you know, there's so much, so much bad architecture standing around, and most of it has been a model at some point, and it must have been such a convincing model that people actually would pay for this. And that there's something in this architectural rendering modeling thing which is kind of, um, again, below the possibilities of model. It's all about selling, rendering, and all this. And actually, my whole series of model studies is about the architectural model, which is not for the client, which I think is probably more, more interesting because it's a tool for development, it's a tool for understanding, it's a tool for having ideas rather than a tool for representing ideas. <clears throat> but this one is a representation of a the German pavilion in the, in the World Expo in 1936, uh, when Nazi Germany wanted to show they were standing opposite side of the Soviet pavilion, and they wanted to show that they uh, are supreme to the, the Soviet, you know, contender. And Speer would sit, uh, not Speer, Speer, and Hitler would sit together with the with the sculptor, and they would from under look from underneath, like you know, their God knees down. You ha I think you have it there. They would look and look from it from underneath how it's actually looking like and how how much you m must be impressed when you see the real picture and that's what I and then again I like the place where you work you know that's something I very often I'm very interested in like where, where artists work but also other people work and not so much like fabrication but very much more like ideas and so that's why I thought it would be interesting for me as well. To, to kind of show that the model is not the model, but the, mo the, ma the, the picture is the model of the model, and if, I, if that's clear, any clearer. But uh, for me, th this, this blew my mind a little bit, because uh, it's really uh, coming out with a big issue that, uh, that are related to the model, and you already thought, well, we have a God look at. And, but first things to say, most of your 
images, uh, just to find a neutral word, or builder uh, to say a Benjamin uh, mm. word, and uh, image space, uh, it, 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 they are interiors. Mm. And I found that this, this is maybe it's part of this way to approach in a different way the model. And I was thinking, uh, when I saw this image, I don't know why my connection went with uh, an, an image of an exhibition uh, MoMA, mm -hmm. of uh, James Stirling. They use a lot uh, in drawing what they call in, uh, in, in English, especially, a uh, warm view. Mm -hmm. That's the view from below. Mm -hmm. To have uh, the same perception, no? Exactly not to have uh, the, the perspective, uh, astronometric view. And uh, it, in this exhibition that is, uh, it was about the one I was building, there is this model that is suspended in a way that you can look in the mm. same way. Like mm. to be inside, you are still a giant, mm. but you look inside. But it's very interesting, that's yeah, changing your whole perspective, no, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. No, but models, I mean, you know, like the, the, the retirement fund you paying in is a model. The weather forecast is a model. We have like a thousand, you know, models that simply may filters because like the, the complexity of our experience is so overwhelming that we need models to kind of actually understand where we are, what we want, how we are, stuff like that, you know. So medicine, to a big, big degree of medicine is like the, how, we, how we teach medicine is done with models, you know. And so uh, the, for me, the, the model is much bigger than just the model on the table. And I, I see the necessity for the architect to show a model or so for his own design process. And I think it's very, uh, it's a good practice to do that. And I hear very often then, you know, they have this computer rendering for the client and the client thinks like in general, it's a good idea or like the jury said it's price number one, but like the client is not really happy. Then they build a model, make a photograph and the client is very happy it's because he kind of can relate better to that. I, you hear this from very famous architects as much as from not so famous architects. But the, the architectural model is, like, is, is one small part of a big uh, cultural technique, which I would think it is. And, and um, that's what I really, I, I'm really interested in to find out. What, what's, you know, what else is there? And what does make, what is a, what is a model for us? So, well, you know, if it's everything a model, then you just, then, then the term is totally useless. So there must be something where you can say, okay, um, you know, this, there's a, there must be a grammar for models, for instance, which I haven't found. Uh, yes, we, we think it's time <coughs> to, to, to build it. Yeah. So, yeah, a grammar for a model. So, nice perspective. Maybe we open the discussion now. Uh, if you, if, if you want to speak French, si vous voulez parler en français, c'est tout à fait possible. Je crois que Thomas comprend. Uh, if, we, if needed, we can translate. Uh, but raise your hand if you want to, to ask him anything. Um, yeah. I don't see. Yeah, yeah there's somebody. That, that's is a there, microphone for the editorial. I can bring mine. No, I, I give mine and we, we share that one. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I had two questions. Uh, the first one would be about the daily series you have. I was interested in the contrast um, uh, against uh, the historical uh, images you use and those other ones. And the second question um, is related to how you see your pictures when they are reproduced themselves as images and not as prints in, in, in contrast to the large prints you make? Um, thank you for both. Uh, the first is the dailies. So at some point, I'm doing this now, I'm in this game since like two decades, a little more. Um, the idea of photography has changed very much and I know that one of the most significant uh, discourses around photography was the death of photography because you can manipulate it, which was the Photoshop coming in and then you can't believe a photograph anymore and therefore it's doomed. And it turned out to be, as we kind of briefly touched, it turned out to be a complete myth. The popular is, uh, uh, photography is more popular than ever and everybody uses it. Everybody here has a camera in his pocket, which didn't, wasn't the case 20 years ago. And so I had the feeling that there is a lot of 
you know, this communication through pictures, which is actually probably more dominant than the official photography of something. And I wanted to kind of use that uh, like a landscape. As much as I used historical official photographs, or like, I, they're not official, they're just institutional photographs in a sense. Um, I wanted to use that other language of photography much more than I did before. And uh, also, if you, if you, if you imagine a, a writer, like he, you know, I, this, one, this one is probably a short story, but this one is a novel because it takes me a long time to do it. And then I, um, um, and sometimes you want to change, change your format of working. And I just, these dailies, I really wanted to make, not in a day, but maybe a week or something, and never longer. That's the only rule about them. And they should, they should have all the narrative in its own. So this one has, of course, I'm totally aware of that, that it has some external narrative to it, which kind of bring, you know, that's how people kind of can talk about it, and that's how people discuss it. But the daily is always, there's everything which to, can be seen. You w it would be ridiculous to say, this is the coffee cup of Benito Mussolini. It's just a coffee cup, you know. So, and that's what I, um, um, what, I, what I wanted to kind of pursue with the, with the daily, is that it's the narrative content is completely on the picture. It's a picture which is totally subjective and not objective. It's just, the story is not even probably worth telling, and it will be gone tomorrow. It has like... And then this, at the same time, the print is done in a in a in a very old-fashioned way of making prints, which is even if the if the if the dailies are mostly made with an iPhone, but the print itself is made like the, the prints of the 70s, the early photo, color, color photography. And I found the printer who made these, <clears throat> and he's you know he's now a very old man, and he's still making them for me. But so to counter, you know, like it's a it's a poem, like a haiku, like a really short uh, p poem. Not even with poetry, just a po short poem, but the way how it comes to you is like incredibly like far-fetched and very complicated and very rare. And that's I thought would be a good balance between what's on the picture and how the picture looks like. And the second question, um, well, you know, what can I say? It's just my the size of my pictures uh, is usually like that they look like a window, and they're more or less like one to one because the things are one to one. But I, you know, like photography is mostly done. By what I have more of a problem with the, and it's not a problem which I kind of say this is bad, but it's a problem which I'm thinking about, is that most of the pictures you see now are kind of coming from a backlit screen, that you know, like that we look only on things with light behind it, which we didn't also didn't used to do, but the smartphone provides us with that screen, and the, the TVs kind of are big, big smartphones now because they also don't come with a tube anymore. It's kind of a flat. Uh, flat backlit kind of screen, and that has a lot of implications on what we think is kind of a brilliant picture uh, about contrast, about the darkness of a picture, which we kind of are uh, willing to accept. And that has been uh, that overrode I, our kind of expectation for photography as being very sharp, having a, having a lot of gradual nuances and stuff. Uh, we we don't have much of a quality. Um, feel about photography anymore, but what we have now is a much of a, um, a brilliance kind of expectation to photography. So I have to accept it. I think it's still better to see the real picture on the wall because of the, like the bodily you know, encounter with something in life size, but it's, I'm, I'm not sleep, losing sleep over it. D'autres questions? Voilà. Alors, il y a quelqu'un qui va prendre les, les micros et l'amener à l'autre but de la, de la salle. Merci à... Je veux remercier, je prends la chance pour remercier tous les étudiants qui nous ont nous aidés pendant les reprises euh, du colloque. Hein. Merci à vous tous. Et merci encore pour les services sur les micros. OK, thank you so much. As uh, my students know, I'm a huge fan uh, of you. Um, from from uh, really uh, the beginning, and I just want to know. I was very impressed with um, Professor Grotesco in uh, Milan, and uh, also I was impressed because it was a bit different than usual. I saw now you said that you practically always threw away your your paperwork, um, and here in this exhibition you have first the pictures of it, of course, and then you have even the archive of your research. 
uh, like you kind of unfold your brain uh, and show the process of it. And then finally, you even have like the, let's say, the, um, the making of of the pictures itself. And I, I just want to know how this project is a bit different uh, from the others that I saw in this particular situation. Well, the, the, main, the main difference is that these, all these shapes you look at, they're hollow. And the grotto is like made out of full cardboard. That's the most trivial kind of difference, but it makes a huge difference because it doesn't fall into pieces. It doesn't deteriorate. It's going to be, you know, this is uh, lasting more or less forever. I had, the thing was like, it's also incredibly heavy. It's like 38 tons or something, the whole thing. And I, I was working on this with a team. We were working 24 hours. It was incredibly, we had to write software for this. It was incredibly complicated. It was way more complicated than I thought. And so we kept working on that, and I kept missing deadlines. And then um, that thing, I c usually I, it takes you two hours to throw something away, which I built in like two months. But this, th this one, you know, you need a team again to bring it down. And it, I didn't have the time and the nerve, so I just had to actually work around it while we were still working on it. And at some point, this kind of thing was standing in the middle of my studio, and I had, my, I had other things to finish. And then I missed the point to throw it away, basically. Simply, I looked at it and I thought, oh, it's not that bad, in fact. I should probably you know, do something with it. And at that time, somebody asked me to do a show. Um, and I had two proposals. And for, to my surprise, they took both, both of them. And one of them was, I, and that's a completely unrelated story, I went to the Francis Bacon studio in Ireland, in Dublin. <clears throat> there was a seminar about the studio, which was very interesting. And, the local museum has actually the real, uh, the real small, very small studio by Francis Bacon. And usually you would not think that that's of any interest. And I'm not, certainly not Francis Bacon or anywhere close. But I saw, um, you know, you go through and you have like a couple of vitrines with the palettes and the brushes and it's all very stupid. But then you come into this room and it doesn't have a window. It only has a, top, a very small top light. And then you see, like, the, the whole studio was full of crap, like 50 times more than on this picture you see here now. It was full of stuff. And the only area which wasn't, which was open, was the canvas. And there was a blank canvas just standing on the scaffolding because he actually hasn't started with the painting when he died. And you just realize that, that, that you know, like what we look and see in Bacon is always this kind of gestural. Uh, you know, existential threat, but like this was reflected very well in his own studio. He, you know, he needed to wipe things away because everything was overwhelming, and that's what's on the canvases. I mean, there's much more on the canvas, but that's it was in initial, it, it immediately totally clear what this had to do with his practice. And I kind of kept this in mind, and then I thought, okay, if the work is good, then probably the, the practice might also be interesting. If there is a point where you can probably show the, and then I had to kind of uh, make a show out of it, and I decided to have the picture first and not in the end, because usually chronologically, of course, you have the research first and then the model and then the photograph. I have the photograph first, then the research, and then the gro the, the model. So it kind of is inverted in this sense. <clears throat> and then, you know, Fernando Sonia Prada in Milano built a house by Rem, and. Uh, Rem and I, and mutually, we kind of, you know, I wanted to care, she wanted to keep this. I didn't want to care of it, take care of it, because it's so massive and it's kind of a, what do I do with this? Uh, and so they, they basically built a basement, and we decided to we keep it there as a basement, and once a month you can go and see it. Now it's kind of got very popular, and now you can see it anytime you want, but I, I thought it would be really funny if you could say, like, first Wednesday of every month you can see it, the grotto. That's Walter de Maria, of course. Walter de Maria has an earth room in New York, which you can see once a week, um, which is very beautiful. And the fact that it's there is good to know. But even if you don't go, it's still there. And that's the, that's the beauty of that project. So I wanted to do something like that. Anyways, that's how we came together. Other questions? D'autres questions? Yeah, actually, I have another one. <laughs> Yuri. <laughs> okay. Uh, now, also, like you, it uh, was interesting. Um, you said that actually the question of the paper wasn't so much a question. It's like asking a, a, a painter who do acrylic 
uh, why he's doing acrylic, right? And, but it brings still uh, an idea of cleanliness and also uh, order. When we s you show the pictures of uh, how the backyard uh, is, uh, was kind of a more dirt, dirty um, atmosphere or more trashy, let's say, and in your pictures it's like uh, have an idealization and that's through the paper, right, somehow. Yeah, but that, that, that has to do also with, I mean, of course I could use paper with something on it, or like, it never has any writing or, or use or something. It would be easy to do it, but I just, I, you know, what I'm after is not the anecdote. What I'm after is the pic picture behind the anecdote. And the anecdotal story is the one which probably, probably kind of got it into the newspaper or got it in, on their website. But I'm trying to kind of actually distill the 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 icon behind the picture and um, w what if the anecdote is gone do we still have a picture and that's I think is kind of if once I have you know identifiable details of use time all this on it I think that's kind of then it um, it loses that potential time is very important because like what you see on these pictures is something which is in most cases not existing anymore the uh, the actual thing you look at is also not existing anymore. But at the same time, because of the, all these things look like so clean, as you call them, or like, uh, you know, unmolested or un... You know, they like, like they're more, they look more like their utopian uh, sibling than the real object. You just have the feeling that the sta time stands still. And what you said about the interior space is, I grew up in West Germany, and I have to say that at some point I realized that um, in in the Western European hemisphere, the interior space is way more important in terms of historical settings than the exterior space. I wouldn't go so far and say in the East it's al always the outdoor, but but think of all the military parades and everything. We don't have that in the in the in Western Germany at least. We didn't have it. I don't think you have it in Switzerland either. So you could make the point that the interior space is actually the place where narratives get the picture. And so um, most of the interior spaces I do, they look like somebody just left the room. They don't look like the prototype, which of course you can see with other people. They always have this kind of, you know, the chair, how the chair is standing in front of that table, for instance, has a little, it's not in the middle, it has a little angle, which is, you know, okay, either we kind of just go in and do an interview or we just uh, left the room or something like that, and that kind of suspended time is something I uh, I really try to achieve in the pictures, and um, so that's why the objects are also tr have no traces of time or use. Javier, do you have a mic? Thanks a lot for your presentation. Um, while you were uh, having this discussion with Roberto and Julie, um, I was wondering, like, uh, the fact that for many centuries, like, images were always physical, like, uh, I'm thinking of, like, tapestries or mosaics or uh, oil painting, or uh, there was a huge diversity of uh, physicality in images, but, uh, like, in recent decades, or well, starting uh, from the 20th, 20th century, we have seen a progressive like the, the materialization or the physicalization of, of the image. No? And uh, you particularly being a person who works with two media that are associated to the physicality of representation like the, the model and the photography, uh, like uh, analog photography with a particular size, a sense of a scale, uh, also the printing. Um, how do you react uh, to this contemporary condition where uh, every uh, thing is becoming like super flat, like even Mona Lisa uh, is, is, is flat. Like when you, we go to Louvre, it's impossible like to, to see the physicality of the, of the painting because it has been protected, it's behind a layer. And uh, so do you think that we are witnessing like really a triumph of the superficial image, uh, meaning by that banality and also uh, the materialization? Or do you think that there will be a, a comeback of the, of the physicality of images uh, in, in the forthcoming decades? Um, that's very hard to say. Let's, let me answer. I, you know, when I look for people to work with me in, in LA, I very often have artists. 
And what I and so did I in Berlin, and so did I in New York, where I was living before. I have to say that Californian assistants um, are, are very bad in terms of uh, uh, making anything with their hands. And I wondered why that is, and it has to do with the teaching, I think, because the teaching in California is very much co about the conceptual value of an artwork. And so hardly anybody in, in LA thinks that there is a value in making something by hand. They think it need to be the right idea, then you need to execute it, or you find somebody to execute it, which is all his place. You know, I wouldn't say Californian art is worthless because they do that. It's just more. Um, I think we we are on a tra trajectory of like uh, um, the the the. How can you say this? Like that the experience the body has with something is neglected towards a experience the eye and the brain has with something, and I think. Um, now you can say, okay, vinyl came back, and so will kind of made handmade art will come back, and it come it's coming back every now and then. But the um, I think that the it's representing a bigger sculpture, a bigger kind of picture in our society, which you know the society will not miss it as much as they don't miss the Ansel Adams quality of photography anymore, and so. Um, for me, it's not good because I kind of actually think much better with my hands than I think with my head. I have more ideas while I'm working. Um, I'm not saying that I don't think when I work, but like I have more ideas when I'm working uh, with my hands than I have when I sit in front of a computer screen. And I think I share this with many people. But I don't think that the that the cultural environment we are in is like very very supporting a 130 degree, uh, 80 degree. Uh, turnaround into something which used to be like that. I, I think it will be the odd thing, uh, you know, the odd handmade. Oh, this is handmade. That's amazing. And you, it, everything seemed to be, used, used to be handmade in arts, you know. So um, I'm not, and I think it's not. It's not. It doesn't. It's not the end of the world either. It will. It will be. You know, like in the arts, when I kind of got in touch with the uh, with contemporary art, that was the late 70s because I had a friend whose father was a big collector, which I didn't realize at the time. <coughs> um, he, that was like six people in Germany who would be a collector. And there's still a lot of contemporary art from that time, which is really amazing. And so it doesn't have to be too pop popular, I think. So, you know, to survive. So I'm not a pessimist at all, and I think cultural practices and cultural creative, whatever, you know, like every office is now a creative office and not an office anymore. So this is, has a huge kind of uh, attraction to society, but what it actually means to make something creative is going into a direction where the, the physical, the physical uh, interaction with something is not so much needed. And I think like people with ambitious people, truly creative people, this, the amount of these are, is the same. They feel that, and they're trying to kind of introduce like little complications in that process. But I think it's uh, the general director, the trajectory is like going into into a very dematerialized, um, dematerialized, very fast production of images. Again, you know, like you only need like six collectors in the world, or in Germany. Let's think, don't get me wrong. One question about uh, making with hands. Do you draw a lot? Uh, draw? Uh, I do, but I'm not as much as I used to. I, I, do, I, I do drawings. I did drawings, but I'm... Um, they are for myself. You know, it's kind of completely like a notation to find out how, to, how it can work or something. Again, I think when, when you draw, when I draw, I have ma more ideas when I draw than I, if I do something on a computer. I, do, I wouldn't like to generalize it, because obviously I'm the minority in this, but uh, I, th I think it's, it's kind of good if you can draw. And, um, yeah. An end activity. Anyway, that's, I don't know if there's any other question, otherwise we continue a little bit. Uh, uh, and then uh, eventually we go to drink together. But I won't catch uh, an okay, a chance because you, before to start, you, you told me that uh, 
we pass from building uh, setting to build a, a new, a real building. No, and yeah, you want to tell you us something about your next architecture? So. Uh, yeah, now a friend of mine asked me whether I would, be, you know, there is a, it's a company for textile in Denmark, and they're sitting in a really remote part of Denmark, so if you go there as a client, you fly from London, you have to go to Copenhagen, and then you go to Aarhus, and then you take a, take a car for 90 min minutes, and basically you can't go back on the same time, in the same evening, so they're sitting out there, they're really uh, quite an amazing company called Quadrat, and they... Um, they have they work with all the bigger architects in the world and interior designers, um, and then they have this kind of you know very corporate uh, place in in that little village where they're the ma also the main employer. They the big game in town, um, and they own all the grounds around it, <coughs> uh, but they can't build on them because it's all natural reservoir. But like so. When you go, when you can't go back, or when you you don't want to sit in a corporate building somewhere, it's kind of he wanted to have somehow some high kind of excitement about being there, and he asked me whether I could kind of build a meeting point or like something, and I kind of said, okay, I build you a congress center, because I thought that would be funny, and he thought, yeah, well then you build me a congress center, and I'm building a congress center. It's a very small center. It's like oh. a center for like 20 people, but like it's like three uh, pavilions next to each other. Um, and I do everything. I, I mean, I have help in terms of architecture because, like, of course, it shouldn't kill the people when they sit in it, and because it, the roof falls down. But uh, I design. I mean, whatever I can design: the door handles, the chairs, uh, so everything, the lamps, the light. We we just actually working on lamps now, and it's going to be open next September. They already digging the hole out and everything. Um, yeah, it's kind of, you know, if an artist does that, it needs to be a whole experience, I think. An architect has to stop at some point and let people live their own lives. But, like, with, if you want this by me, then you get the whole the whole thing. But it's kind of, it's, it's actually quite interesting because it's also, uh, uh, yeah, architecture, as you all know, is like, a, is like a team effort. And making something like this is a complete solitude uh, experience. And so, you know, like to kind of understand back and forth, like negotiate all this. It's, it's, and then again, the, the, I have to say that the client is a, is, is a dream because he likes everything he sees. He doesn't want to have a temple in front of it. So, um, I, you know, it's, 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 it's very exciting and it's very wonderful. And nobody will ever see it in the flash because nobody goes to this remote part of Denmark. So it's very consistent with my normal photography, you just, you know, you only know it from the pictures, so. Amazing. Je, je, je te laisse conclure. Donc, uh, thank you, Thomas. Merci thank beaucoup. Thank you very much for the attention. And, uh, Merci pour cette, uh, cette conversation qui, pour nous, était passionnante. Je l'espère pour vous aussi. Et puis, uh, on va se retrouver pour, uh, pour boire un verre. Et je vous souhaite une excellente suite de soirée. Merci pour votre attention. Merci, Thomas. Applaudissements.